my legal name is Richard Penniman, but I'm known to everybody as Little Richard, the architect of rock and roll. When I would wear makeup, they would let me sing for the white girls. When I put on eyelashes and all that, they would let me sing. But when I went as a just straight dude, they would let me sing. You have a right to wear what you want to wear, whether it's pretty or ugly. There has been persistent confusion and controversy surrounding the death of Little Richard. However, recent reports indicate that his son, Danny Jones Penniman, has finally laid some of those rumors to rest. Little Richard stands as one of the most iconic singer-songwriters in the history of music. Hey, An original pioneer of rock music, he left an indelible mark with signature 1950s hits such as Tutti Frutti, Long Tall Sally, and Good Golly Miss Molly. Renowned rock stars credit him for shaping their sounds and contributing to the establishment of the rock and roll genre. This is a man who knows how to scream. His significant contributions led to inductions into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Songwriters Hall of Fame, in addition to receiving a Lifetime Achievement Grammy Award. Born Richard Wayne Penniman, the iconic rocker experienced marriage once, tying the knot with Ernestine Harvin from 1957 to 1964. Throughout his life, Richard grappled with a complex relationship with his sexuality. At times, he openly identified as gay, as revealed in a 2016 GQ interview where he discussed his father's reaction. Quote, he said he wanted seven boys and that I had spoiled it because I was gay. Despite these statements, there were instances where he expressed conflicting views on his orientation. In a 2017 interview with 3ABN, as reported by Ebony, Richard spoke against the LGBTQ community. Despite the complexities surrounding his personal life, Richard had only one child, his adopted son, Danny Jones Penniman. Danny Jones' biological mother is Criola Jones. At the time of her encounter with the good golly Miss Molly singer, she resided in South Central Los Angeles and was a single mother to several children. Their connection deepened when Danny's mother, while attending church, established a strong rapport with Richard. It was during this period that Danny's mother approached Richard and requested if he could take her son Danny under his wing. Regarding this matter, Danny once said, quote, I had six sisters and three brothers living in a poor neighborhood doing whatever. My mom asked him, Richard, could he take care of me? The star's kid further elaborated on the reason why his mom did this. He added, quote, because she didn't want me turning out like the rest of my sisters and brothers, and he agreed to it. On May 9, 2020, little Richard, the legendary musician, departed from the realm of the living. He passed away at the age of 87 in his residence in Tennessee. The reported cause of his death was bone cancer. Confirming his father's demise, Danny Jones Penniman personally conveyed the news to Rolling Stone. After Danny's father died, he revealed that his mother had asked Richard to take him in. Quote, he would never say anything to me about whatever I was doing. He would just always encourage me, he told Rolling Stone. Danny joined his father on the road and he shared insights into the wisdom his dad imparted over the years. Reflecting on Little Richard's parenting style, Danny explained, quote, Parenting for him was, he would say something to you and you had to figure it out. He further recounted some of his father's advice, such as, You control the money, don't let the money control you. As a child, these statements might have seemed cryptic, but as life unfolded, Danny came to understand their significance. In the latter years of Little Richard's life, Danny remained closely connected, residing and working with him in Tennessee. Danny shared that in the final stages, Richard's attention had shifted significantly towards his life in the church. Following his father's passing in 2020, Danny took on the role of confirming and announcing the news. Since Little Richard's death, Danny has maintained a relatively private profile. The most interesting thing is that people believe that Richard himself also sent a cryptic message before he died. Little Richard earned the title The Architect of Rock and Roll for his pioneering contributions to the genre. While an architect traditionally designs structures, in this context it refers to Richard's groundbreaking approach to rock music. He defied conventions by accelerating the tempo of his songs, setting a new standard in pop music. Even behind a piano, his unmatched stage presence exuded confidence in an unprecedented manner. However, his audacious style was not universally embraced in Hollywood. Despite the remarkable aspects of his career, it's intriguing to explore why the singer made the decision to return to school to acquire literacy skills. I stopped and went to school, you know. 
I've never made this type of money, David. You know, I was making $15 a week in Macon, and all of a certain I'm making $10,000 an hour, so I, I went back to school to learn. Motivated by a desire to comprehend the intricacies of the music industry, Little Richard returned to school with a specific goal, to understand his earnings and protect himself from exploitation by unscrupulous figures in Hollywood. During a past interview, as he discussed his decision to pursue education, the audience erupted in laughter, possibly interpreting his move as eccentric. Yet Little Richard, undeterred by the laughter, was well aware of the importance of his actions and had a clear understanding of what he aimed to achieve. I needed to know how to handle the money. I had a lot of managers that was handling it a whole lot, taking it all, leaving me nothing. I didn't yeah. even know how to count for nothing that they yeah. left. So I went back to school to study. Richard openly embraced his identity as a gay man. Charles White's 1984 biography, The Life and Times of Little Richard, intricately weaves together accounts from Richard himself and those in his inner circle, including fellow artists. The biography chronicles his journey from a young gospel singer in Georgia to becoming a trailblazing figure in Southern rock and roll. Within its pages, Richard reflects on the early experiences that played a crucial role in shaping his identity throughout the years. Never had it, can't get it, don't want to know where to find it. <laughs> From a young age, Little Richard expressed what some around him in his childhood viewed as, quote, a feminine sensibility experimenting with his mother's makeup and clothing. At the age of 15, he faced expulsion from his home by his deacon father. Undeterred, he embarked on a journey into the world of performance, captivating audiences at various venues around Atlanta. His travels led him to the Chitlin Circuit, a network of performance spaces across the southern United States that provided a safe platform for black musicians, comedians, and entertainers during the era of segregation. Growing up in Georgia, Richard was exposed to the contrasting religious practices of his mother's Baptist congregation and the lively participatory worship at the African Methodist Episcopal Church, where his father served as a minister. During his childhood, little Richard navigated challenges and overcame adversity due to his physical peculiarities. As he recounted to biographer Charles White in The Life and Times of Little Richard, Richard's childhood was marked by a distinctive appearance. A large head, one big eye, and one little eye. However, the most prominent anomaly was his little leg. His right leg was three inches shorter than his left, significantly affecting his walking style. His gait had an irregular cadence, and his pronounced hip sway led neighborhood children to mistakenly believe he was attempting a, quote, feminine walk. Regrettably, Richard became a target for homophobic slurs and verbal abuse from some of his peers. However, rather than succumbing to the negativity, the experience fueled a competitive spirit within him. Growing up as one of 12 siblings, he always had a familial rival to challenge in various pursuits. Interestingly, Little Richard's little leg played a pivotal role in his introduction to music. People magazine highlighted that Richard's mother believed attending church could heal his physical condition. Although his leg never lengthened, attending church exposed Richard to the world of music where he discovered the extraordinary power of his vocal abilities. As his musical career unfolded, he encountered the harsh realities of racial discrimination and exploitation. White record labels disproportionately profited from his talent, and even Pat Boone's cover of Tutti Frutti outperformed Richard's original recording. A significant aspect of Richard's identity Entity that emerged prominently was his complex personality, which, while embraced by some as part of his flamboyant rock and roll persona, faced challenges from a mainstream audience less willing to accept it. Despite being a monumental voice of his generation, Little Richard found himself entangled in what is often regarded as one of the worst record deals in history. Expelled from his father's home at 15 due to his flamboyant nature, he found solace and support in the local Georgia music community. Six years later, his breakthrough came when he secured a record deal with RCA Records after a standout performance at the TikTok Club in Georgia. Drawing inspiration from South Carolina-based pianist Escarita, known for his expressive makeup and pompadour hairstyle, Little Richard adopted a spirited musical and personal style that would leave an indelible mark on the history of rock and roll. When I would wear makeup, they would let me sing for the white girls. When I put on eyelashes and all mm -hmm. that, they would let me sing. But when I went as a just straight dude, they would let me sing. Now, now why is that? Uh, well, they thought I wanted the girls. Uh -huh. Quote, when I first came along, I never heard any rock and roll. When I started singing rock and roll, I sang it a long time before I presented it to the public because I was afraid they wouldn't like it. I never heard nobody do it, and I was scared. Little Richard told Rolling Stone magazine in 1990. Little Richard's ascent to fame was marked by a slow and challenging journey. Despite being a signed artist, the initial five years of his career saw minimal radio play. 
To make ends meet and support his family, he took on shifts as a dishwasher at a Greyhound station. It was during these dishwashing duties that the iconic line from his first hit, Tutti Fruity, was born. A wop bop alu bop, a wop bam boom. Little Richard forwarded the record to Specialty Records located in Chicago. Subsequently, the song achieved its pinnacle at number 17 on the pop chart. Over the ensuing years, Little Richard continued to unveil more chart-topping hits such as Long Tall Sally, reaching number 6 on the pop chart and Slippin' and Slidin', his fusion of southern gospel and blues from Georgia into the burgeoning rock and roll scene, coupled with his enthralling stage presence swiftly garnered national acclaim. However, his triumphs failed to translate into financial prosperity as he fell victim to rampant exploitation. Furthermore, despite his escalating national acclaim, the music industry remained predominantly segregated during the 1950s. Following a short break from rock and roll and a foray into gospel music, Little Richard made a comeback in the mid-1960s, sharing the stage with other icons like the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan. By the end of the decade, his achievements were underscored by sold-out shows in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, and Toronto. His global renown solidified his status as a living legend, yet his personal challenges persisted. I started drinking all kinds of liquors. Then I went into I, I, I used to take so much co to my nose was big enough to park diesel trucks in. The vocalist grappled with addiction, engaging in substantial consumption of LSD, PCP, heroin, and c Notably, he candidly revealed to People magazine that he was blowing about $1,000 of coke. When I'd blow my nose, blood and flesh would come out on my handkerchief, Little Richard elaborated. Due to drug use, he would be unable to remember entire days at a time, lose track of time, and, quote, somehow forgot that because of a birth defect, his right leg was three inches shorter than his left. His acknowledgement of being introduced to drugs strongly suggests that someone somewhere may have intended for him to lose focus and a sense of self. My dad had died. He got My best friend my father. Indeed, it is quite surprising. In a parallel reality, Bud Penniman, Little Richard's father, could have embraced his son fully, as detailed in The Life and Times of Little Richard, initially critical of Richard's choice to pursue a career in music, Bud underwent a transformation in his perspective. Later on, he began to listen to his son's songs with a sense of pride. This shift occurred when Richard was 19 and starting to establish himself as a performer. He recalled, quote, My daddy had never been behind me in my career until then, and he was just starting to come behind me. He was going to buy me a car to help me in my traveling. Unfortunately, Buddy never had the chance to give his son that car. In a revealing GQ interview, Little Richard shared, quote, My best friend Frank shot him. He was out of jail in a week. We never quite found out what really happened. The incident transpired outside a bar where Frank Tanner, Richard's friend, had been playfully tossing firecrackers into a coal stove at the Tip Inn, owned by Bud. Annoyed by the antics, Bud expelled Frank from the establishment and the situation quickly escalated. Frank created a disturbance outside, prompting Bud to grab a gun and confront him. The precise details of the altercation remain unclear. But the tragic outcome was Bud's death. In one devastating moment, Little Richard lost the man who played a role in giving him life, but had also made that life tumultuous. The scars from his father's rejection endured, and Richard would grapple with self-reflection in the years that followed. As highlighted earlier, Hollywood offered little protection to Richard, even in clear-cut cases. It was not just music fans who adored Tutti Frutti. Pat Boone also recognized its appeal and promptly recorded his own version. This pattern would persist throughout Little Richard's career with other artists, particularly white ones replicating his music, and Hollywood executives failing to assist him in maintaining control. In the instance of Tutti Frutti, Boone initially enjoyed greater success with his rendition despite its inferior quality. Indeed, Pat Boone had a recurring pattern of appropriating Little Richard's work, leading Richard to perceive it as a consequence of racial bias. In a 1984 interview with the Washington Post, Richard expressed his frustration, stating, quote, When Tutti Frutti came out, Elvis was immediately put on me, dancing and singing my songs on television. In The Life and Times of Little Richard, he recollected that a lot of people in management didn't like it because I was a white attraction, suggesting that this bias translated into blatant disrespect. For instance, during performances in Las Vegas, Richard received inferior accommodations compared to white musicians and faced financial exploitation. All 
all black records, which was called race records at the time, was played on black stations only. Pat Boone covered Tutti Frutti, although he covered a lot of other people. He was covering everybody that could be covered. He refused to endure such treatment in silence and actively called for fairer treatment. Ultimately, he held the belief that racism unjustly deprived him of his rightful musical legacy. In a 99 interview with the Washington Post, Little Richard proudly asserted his role as, quote, the architect of rock and roll. If it's a white guy, they say he's the king of rock and roll. But if it's a black guy, they add self-proclaimed. They say he's the self-proclaimed king of rock and roll. Nobody claimed me, can't nobody shoot me because they, they haven't given me anything. I couldn't borrow nothing. They didn't help me. I just lived on the mercy of God and I made it through blood and sweat and guts. Throughout his illustrious career, Little Richard garnered numerous awards and accolades that recognized his significant contributions to music. Notably, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1986 and later received induction into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. His impact was further acknowledged with Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Recording Academy and the Rhythm and Blues Foundation. In 2015, he was honored with a Rhapsody and Rhythm Award by the National Museum of African American Music, acknowledging his pivotal role in advancing African-American music and culture, especially during a time marked by racial divisions in the United States. Additionally, the Library of Congress included his iconic song Tutti Frutti in the National Recording Registry in 2010, cementing its cultural and historical significance. But <laughs> I used to wear my hair like that. They take everything I get, they take it from me. In the mid-1980s, Little Richard made a triumphant return to the cultural spotlight after a self-imposed hiatus dedicated to religious pursuits and spiritual contemplation. His comeback lasting more than a decade solidified him as a cherished and entertaining figure in American pop culture, rock and roll, and nostalgia. In 1984, the release of his biography marked the beginning of his resurgence. This was followed by Lifetime Friend, his first pop recording in over a decade. The lead-off track, Great Gosh Almighty, featured in the film Down and Out in Beverly Hills, which also starred Little Richard, enjoyed success on the Billboard Pop Chart. Little Richard, an inaugural inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, became a ubiquitous presence on television. He made appearances on popular shows like Miami Vice, Baywatch, and Martin. Notably, in 1994, he starred in a special episode of Full House. In this episode, focused on the school arts program, Little Richard, playing himself, delivers a lively performance of Keep a Knockin' with Uncle Jesse's band The Rippers, after playing Itsy Bitsy Spider on Uncle Jesse's keyboard. In the end, the music legend passed away with some regrets, underscoring the notion that a life devoid of regrets might mean one has not lived or learned enough from life's challenges. Little Richard's journey involved a substantial amount of living and earning often through difficult experiences. One of the harshest lessons of his career was the realization that he lacked the knowledge to prevent ruthless music companies from exploiting his earnings. Reflecting on this in a 1984 interview with Jet, the iconic artist confessed, quote, I was ignorant, illiterate, really. I was so glad to be famous, but if I had my life to live over again, one of my greatest desires would be to be more educated so I could protect myself. Instead of reliving his life, Little Richard found himself repeatedly battling with specialty records. Records. According to Royalty Exchange, he initially signed with the label in 1955 with a contract stipulating that he would own all music rights and receive 50% of the royalties. However, he soon discovered that the company's specialty was not honoring their financial commitments to him. Unfortunately, he sold the publishing rights for $50, leading to him earning only half a cent per record sale instead of a substantial fortune. In 1959, Richard sued and settled for $11,000, relinquishing his claim to royalties for several classics, including Tutti Frutti and Long Tall Sally. The legal battles persisted, and in 1984, he sued specialty records once again, along with other parties, seeking $112 million and control of his music. They eventually reached an out-of-court settlement in 86. The Rock King would go on to live for another 34 years, dying in 2020. Celebrating an American original, Little Richard, a founding father of rock and roll with an unforgettable flair, he has died. In his prime, Little Richard wasn't just a showstopper. He was the embodiment of non-stop showmanship. On stage, Richard was dynamic. Constantly in motion, he would seamlessly transition from being on the stage to off it, jumping, yelling, and screaming. His energy was infectious, whipping the audience into a frenzy. Vintage footage captures Richard skillfully balancing with a leg propped atop the piano, all while singing with unparalleled passion and intensity. Oh, 
Watching Little Richard perform, you quickly realize that for him, the adage, the show must go on, took on a unique significance because his audience never wanted the spectacle to end. However, even the most energetic showman eventually faces the inevitable slowdown. In his later years, Richard grappled with the challenges of sciatica. As reported by Ultimate Classic Rock, sciatica, characterized by radiating pain along the sciatic nerve, affecting the lower back, buttocks, and hips, became an increasing hindrance for the music legend. Once the epitome of perpetual motion, Richard found himself in a situation where his hip was failing him, necessitating a replacement. In 2009, he underwent a long overdue operation, though the outcome proved less than ideal. According to the Oxford American, the aftermath was catastrophic for Richard, who lamented, quote, the hip surgery was really bad for me. I haven't walked since. I'm in pain 24 hours a day. Rock and roll, a genre that never fades away, witnessed the departure of one of its legends on May 9, 2020, when the vibrant rock and roll soul of Little Richard transcended his earthly confines at the age of 87. According to The Guardian, the latter part of Richard's life was marked by declining health, including a heart attack, a stroke, and issues with his hip. His agent, Dick Allen, disclosed that Richard ultimately succumbed to bone cancer, a battle he had been fighting for many years. Allen shared, quote, He was battling for a good while, many years. I last spoke to him about two or three weeks ago. His fans also can never forget him. One of them wrote, quote, The influence he had was undeniable. Hopefully now he can get the deserving respect for how big of an impact he had on not just music but pop culture. Dude was a legend among legends. Another one added, quote, R.I.P. Little Richard, you are most talented and memorable musician I've ever heard. Thanks for making my childhood rock, no pun intended, by singing the Magic School Bus theme and making guest appearances on Sesame Street. Rosita will miss you. One more person added, quote, Richard Wayne Penniman, aka Little Richard, you will be greatly missed immensely. May you shine gracefully in sweet heaven. Your music and persona will be always treasured. You're a pioneer and pure music royalty gone but never forgotten. Salute. As one of the original inductees of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Recording Academy, his status as a legend is undeniable. As a non-conventional black artist and pioneer, his contributions continue to shape artistry and the industry today.